One day, people are going to come down to my level of just admitting to being incredibly slovenly when they're at home. You know, too lazy to do their hair today. Could have done, you know, like the whole YouTuber thing of like studio lights and all that. But you know, that ain't real. You've seen all those clips where people just jump in like editing person here and they're looking as though they've just been dragged through a hedge backwards. Well, that is how I live my life. And that is how we're going to do things today. So, hi everyone, my name is Charlie, and today I'm going to be talking about nothing in particular, which is kind of a lie, because I do have some things on my mind that I'll be talking about. So, yeah. Firstly, the whole reason I thought I'd sit down and make this video is because I just had a success making this mint choc rooibos latte and I just wanted to glory in the fact that I made myself such a good drink considering I'm out of coffee. There's no coffee for the coffee machine and this is upsetting to me. I love that drink. Yesterday there was a thing on radio too. About half past one, I heard it whilst I was at work, talking about the amount of caffeine that somebody that someone should consume in a day, and how there was like a daily limit and any, anything. I was like, well, if it was a target, then I'm surpassing that target. It's, you know, I'm getting a bonus at the end of the year, the amount of caffeine that I'm putting into this body. And then they got to talking about when a child should be given its first cup of tea, and she said. 12 years old and no more than a certain amount of milliliters. And I was like, oh my goodness. Love by the age of 12, I was supping at least 10 pints a day. I'm on 10 pints of tea now. And that's a, that's a minimum. And Well, actually, I've added coffee into that. So sometimes tea falls by the wayside when I'm off work and I'm getting through an entire filter coffee machine. That's actually a nine pot coffee machine. But because of the size of my mug, it's only three. And apparently that can lead to problems down the road. I'm like, I can't actually physically get any more problems, I don't think. Well, that's a lie. Touch wood. There are physically, you know, there's tons of other problems I could have thrown my way other than arthritis, asthma and all those bloody lovely things. But don't be trying to take me caffeine away as well. I've already given up sugar. Was that not enough? I limit me carbs. If I have more than two slices of bread a day, I start feeling guilty. Can we not just, can we just avoid stealing me coffee off me as well? That's all I'm going to say. <sighs> so let's talk about some of the books that I am currently reading, which shouldn't take me too long to talk about one that I haven't read since I spoke to you last, which is Vita Nostra by Marina and Sergei Diachenko, translated by Julia Maitoff Hersey. Haven't read this book anymore since last we spoke. I have, however, finally finished Life After Life by Kate Atkinson. And I said it on Instagram, and I'm going to say it again here. This felt like a readerly achievement for me. Way back when this book was first published, with it being Kate Atkinson, it was somewhat hyped, and Joy from the writers group told me that she had enjoyed this book. Indeed, there's a video where Charlie and I are talking, and we recorded it quite recently, and I said about the whole reason I wanted to get through this book is because Joy had told me there were passages she would go back and read just for the prose. Well, last week we went out for coffee, and she told me she didn't like the book. So after she told me she didn't like the book, I said, well, the only reason I'm reading it is because you told me that you liked it. And she said that it had, thinking back on it, it had been the TV show she didn't like because of the way that they'd adapted it and she found it too repetitive in the visual form. In terms of the novel, I have tried to read this book many times over the years. I don't know whether it's five or six. I would get through 50 pages, then put the book down. It's not the only book that I've done this with in the past. There are so many books on my shelves. The Elegance of the Hedgehog being one that I'm looking at right now, Bleak House by Dickens, are books that I have started 
and put down having enjoyed what I'd read. In terms of Life After Life, however, I think that the reason I've DNF'd and returned it to the charity shop so many times has been, one, because I don't think that I was the right age or reader to have been reading the book at the time, and two, because I was looking at this book as just a general war novel, and one of the things that I've always avoided are novels that are set during the Second World War, even the First World War. Some people like to go and be reminded of that time period and think about the grief and think about how brutal it was. And for me, it was because for many years at high school, all we talked about was the war. And it, similar to when I talk about how many times I read To Kill a Mockingbird, it feels like i done this already. So I avoided this book for the longest time, thinking I was just going to be reading another typical war novel. Well, firstly, it focused more on the character of Ursula and the way that Atkinson wrote this. So for those who don't know, which I can't imagine there are many, Life After Life follows this idea of living, par not parallel lives, but Ursula will die and then there's almost like the reset in Tomb Raider when we'll go back to a point and we'll get to see that life lived again with certain things having happened and certain things having not happened. For the reader, Atkinson plays with this sometimes. When we return to a scene, it can end up going the way that the reader wants it to go or the Ursula and other characters can make different decisions and it goes off in a different direction that's not necessarily what the reader had hoped for. Uh, sometimes we get to see Ursula living successful life, sometimes we get to see her living somewhat less successful, perhaps bleaker lives. Through this character of Ursula, Atkinson is able to look at World War II through different lenses and show different things that were going on. It's also different for me to be reading this book, to be seeing the character of Ursula and seeing the people who were actually at home during the war, as opposed to seeing things on the actual battlefield. So that was different as well. And admittedly, that is something that I have appreciated in the novels of Elizabeth Taylor, who has books set during the war, but for the most part, they're set in the post-war world where people are trying to reacclimatize to a new world. But also, one of the things that I thoroughly appreciated about Life After Life were the relationships that Ursula had with her siblings and with her family members. That is something that didn't really change throughout the lives that Ursula led. Sorry if you can hear Sally scratching in the background. It's something that I've noticed in other works by Atkinson is the way in which she will talk about families. So in Emotionally Weird, Effie has a somewhat fraught relationship with the person who she believes to be her mother. And you get to hear this somewhat twisty, turny tale of her familial life towards the end of that novel. Whilst I haven't read Human Croquet or Behind the Scenes at the museum, both of them seem to be looking at generations of families. And when I was talking about Shrines of Gaiety with Charlie last week, I talked about the fact that Atkinson seems to have developed this thing of looking back at history and discussing time periods. But when I look at the blurb of Shrines of Gaiety, that is also talking about a family and a mother, uh, which I don't know whether she's looked at that role in the family yet, whether we've always had Atkinson looking at, at family from the lens of a daughter or a child of the family. But that interests me to read that one and see whether this is a common theme within her prose, whether she is going to examine a family or she uses them as the core characters or they are who the story is actually about, as opposed to the story being, as with this one, the alternative lives a person can lead. I've actually very much enjoyed it this time and say that had I been the reader that I was when I first read this or tried to read this, I don't think that I would have been having the same appreciation of the novel that I do have now and I'm glad to have read it and despite the fact it did talk about the war a lot I think that it wasn't necessarily 
a war novel. It was more of an examination of the people at the time, the way they coped, and the attitudes they might have had. Also, Charlie, a few years ago, wouldn't have cared for this book because of the class of people that were being written about. And I'm not saying that we've got over that. I'm just saying we can put that aside and enjoy a novel. When I mentioned that I'd finished the book on Instagram, Sarah of Hardcover Hearts and Sophie of Redhead Reading, among others, got in touch and told me that I should read A God in Ruins. And it just so happens that we did have a copy at the charity shop. It's water damaged, it's creased to beggary, but it'll do for a read and also means that I can probably take it into the bath with me. I know that this book follows the younger Todd sibling of Teddy and I'm intrigued because most people have said that they found this book heartbreaking and so we will see what I think. I know that this doesn't follow the same format of Life After Life and the character doesn't have all these different lives. It's a linear storyline about the character and I believe some other characters from within the family. But this is going to be a treat for me when I finally finish reading the books that I have to read for the Booktube Prize, of which I have now got three from the library. I've read one and two are on order. And the one that I know that I'm going to despise with every fibre of my being, I'm not reading yet. However, the ones from the library, I do have to get read rather quickly because there are reserves on them already. One that I have started, I, I was caught by the voice, but then on the fourth page, it made a error in terms of time. Once again, if you watched my video with Charlie um, related to the liter literally Doris read-along, then you will have seen me talk about how much I researched up to find out whether stuff was around at certain time periods. And the author makes a seemingly innocuous reference to something, just to have a joke between a couple of people. Uh, but it pulled me out of the story immediately because I started thinking, well, that didn't become popular until this year. So <sighs> I don't know how I feel. When, I know it's only four pages in, so I could go a bit further and end up really appreciating this book. But we'll see. One reason that I wanted to finish Life After Life was so that I could focus on Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver. This is the very nice Waterstones exclusive edition that Charlie got me for Christmas, despite the fact that she knew I had the Ark from NetGalley. And as beautiful as this book is, due to my wrist playing up at the moment, I'm finding it difficult to hold on to a hefty book, so I have had to resort to my Kindle to read this one. And one thing that I have recognised with this book is that I'm trying to treat it like all these other books and trying to get it through, through it quickly. Uh, when Charlie and I have discussed this book, we've talked about how close it is to David Copperfield. And that seems to have changed a bit now. And I know from something that AJ said to me in the comments last week about this book is that it's going to discuss the opioid crisis of the 1990s in America. And... I look forward to getting to those parts simply because it's something that I've looked at in Prozac Nation. It's a topic that I'm interested in. And I am now seeing where King Solver has changed the trajectory of the tale and is using the characters and the store, original story as more of a... not a catalyst or well, I say a conduit to tell this tale she wants to tell. Still very much appreciate the narratorial voice, but I do have to go somewhat slower with this book because of the themes that it's discussing. And I think that that is the way I have to go about a book that is discussing something that I find a bit darker and difficult to read about. It doesn't mean that it's a bad book. It just means that I have to take my time with it and read it more slowly because otherwise I would just put it aside and not read it. So Charlie and I are reading it in increments of 10 chapters at a time and then discussing it. She's much further ahead than I am, um, but I read seven chapters last night, which was my first 
proper foray of reading it without having life after life there. And I want to read some more today and just steadily get through it as opposed to trying to read a huge chunk all at once and potentially not appreciate it as much because I find it difficult to read about some of the things that King Solbert is talking about. But as I say, very strong narratorial voice and is doing what King Solbert does best, in my opinion, and shedding a light on a community that is often not seen or discussed. Meanwhile, talking about heavy books, I have Our Share of Nights by Mariana Enrique, translated by Megan McDowell. And I was, I, like, I flew through the first 50 pages of this book and then put it aside to read other things. And I really do want to read this. But as I've said, hefty books are just not good for my wrists at the moment. So this might be a sit down and hope it stays open on the table for me to read. It's a, it's a tough one. I could just probably get some wrist splints and um, read with those on. Uh, but for the moment, apart from Demon Copperhead, the books I have to focus on are all fewer than 500 pages. So we should be okay. Thought I saw a spider on the ceiling. It was a cobweb. I'll clean it one day. I've been thinking about decorating this room for at least two years now. I haven't painted it since 2007. This was really cheap paint from Wilkinson's. So much more for your money. Wilco's now. And it's held up, really. You know, there's a few spots here and there where it's disappeared. And by the wall, there's a fantastic crack where the plaster's gone and the wall probably needs replastering. But for the most part, I think that we've got a good paint job done with that cheap paint. So I mentioned Instagram a lot in this video because that's where I talked about life after life and where people contacted me. I did an experiment that I never told anybody about where I tried to post every single day to Instagram uh, from the 4th of January 2022 to the 4th of January 2023. Towards the end of 2022, it did peter off a bit because I found it somewhat repetitive. Now, I still think that there's this whole thing about the aesthetic of the Instagram and following something of a theme and having set photos appearing at set times. But Bayek, I, I, I didn't get as heavily involved in Instagram as people could do. You know, like there are people on there commenting all the time, um, interacting with other folk and doing all that sort of thing. And maybe if I did, we'd be selling more books over here. But I call it an experiment because I wanted to see whether it would affect me in any way, whether it would make me want to look at social media more and become this social media type person. Because, you know, I got, I got the Twitter there, I got the Instagram, we're on YouTube. I di didn't like, I, I honestly, at times, I'd get concerned about getting addicted to social media and my sister will still bring up stuff now where she'll say oh you're really good at Instagram you get and she'll look at the likes and stuff that I've got in comparison to her like well I was using it every day for one thing and her you know I look at it from like a bookish background and what have you she was just posting personal things not that personal I just mean you know it's not to try and rate a profile or something and it's not niche like books but to try and get a photo every day like I was posting just pictures of books that at times that I hadn't even read and like I've done that now with A God in Ruins just because coincidentally we managed to have a copy at the shop but I don't know I'm glad not to be using it every day and when I stopped using it every day it did kind of uh, mean that I didn't have this whole thing of like being on there liking things regularly because I thought people might get upset. Another thing I saw on there was because I was also doing indie author posts whenever I talked about Doris, I would sometimes get other indie authors or people who were planning to release their books independently contacting me. And I'm not going to name names because that seems mean for what I'm about to say. But sometimes these people have very rose-tinted views as to what they would receive in, in from indie publishing and what their rewards would be. And 
don't seem to have recognised that although a person might say they're going to read your very epic novel that's 800 pages long and you've thrown out all the rules and everything, that doesn't mean that they will. Just because they've added it to their shelf on Goodreads doesn't mean that they will. Thousands of people have added Doris to their shelves on Goodreads because of times when it was in competitions and that was one way that they could um, compete to win a copy. But it doesn't mean they've ever gone on to read that book. But also, apart, aside from that, these people, have these writers, are behaving with an arrogance that might be all right in your early to mid-twenties, fine, I've talked about this last week. If your prime, Still, if your primary goal is to make money, then you're going to be very upset indeed. But there are other writers on there who are talking about they're going to finish writing their first draft by such and such a time. So say, basically, some person said that they were going to do their, finish their first draft by March. Then from the first draft, they were going to have it edited by April. And they were listing all these things that ordinarily take a really long time in the grand scheme of publishing things. And then they were going to release the book in September. They have no cover design, they're just using Instagram as a platform to publicise the book. And it's this kind, of, this kind of like, I, it can be done, it can be done, but is it going to be the best your book could be? Like, even with Royally Doris, and with An Heir to Murder, the reason, like, my own publishing has slowed down is because of the things that I wanted to do outside of that, um, you know, to do with the editing and getting the book done. So with An Heir to Murder, I finished that a year before I asked Dane to look at it. And part of me still wishes I'd waited to release it, but I didn't, didn't foresee a global pandemic, as I keep saying. And with Royally Doris, I finished that in the October of 2021, started editing that myself after a month away from it. So I let myself have, well no, two months away because I let myself have the end of the year off um, to get time away. So I went editing it with a fresh mind or whatever they say. Then I had Charlie, Emily, Joy and my mother who'd all read it as beta readers that's only four. I've had more in the past. Like, our Doris had 14. And then Dane came on board and edited the thing for me. Still managed to get it edited much quicker than I anticipated. Even then, like, before all that, I'd also edited it and done a huge major structural change. All this is documented, but that it ended up being 11 months. So nearly an entire other year before that book came out because of all the work that needed doing to it. And you can't know that your editor's not going to come to you and say, actually, you really need to make this huge change to the structure to make this work. And it's just... It's a thing where I think that just because it's independent publishing and you're doing it yourself doesn't mean that you, need, you should miss steps. I'm aware, and I get upset about it every time I find, one, that there are mistakes in my books. Somebody a writer who will remain nameless, once sent me an entire list of the mistakes that they had found in one of my books. It's like, well, this is very kind and what have you, and I understand why you did this, but you could have just kept it to yourself because now I'm sad. Yes, I did go in and change them. It's one thing that sometimes annoys me, and it shouldn't annoy me, because I shouldn't hold people to the same standards that I hold myself. But I think that when certain people have a stigma, certain readers have a stigma against indie authors, you almost have to work a bit harder to make sure that your book is as polished as it can be. And you also have to be a bit more professional because you aren't going to have the same publicity. You aren't going to have the same people reading your books. You can, you're still going to be de denigrated by a lot of authors. I have friends who've been traditionally published. I have friends who've been traditionally published who now want to independently publish <sighs> because of the way they've been treated by traditional publishers. But they've still had that foot in the door, so they're still going to have fans pick up their books and not look at who published their book because, to them, they were traditionally published first. It was one of the reasons that I didn't necessarily lie, but I stopped telling people that I was my own publisher. 
um, because I found that it could really ruin a sale. People would come along to my readings and be thoroughly entertained by what I'd read and come over and share their enjoyment of it. But as soon as I said I published it myself, that was it. They weren't interested anymore. They walked away. Um, so I started saying it's published by a small publisher in Cheshire. Not a lie, but easier than admitting that I was doing all of this myself with the help of readers and editors. In terms of bringing out a book yourself, until you're completely sure that your book can come out by a certain time or you can get everything done by a certain time, don't be giving people dates for stuff to be happening. And also sometimes don't share as much of your writing as you want to. Like we're all proud of certain bits of writing, but we also sometimes have to kill our darlings. And sometimes you might think that you've written something really epic and amazing with fantastic dialogue, but it reads like something that the CW would air 10 years ago and does nothing to give any sense of who your character is. And also sometimes your scenes are just repetitive. It's an 800 page novel. It is repetitive. And that's all I'll say on that matter. Just, as I, another thing I've said, I'm all for throwing out the rule book when it comes to writing. But at least acknowledge what rules are there and why you've chosen to break them. And don't think that just because you've chosen to break rules, it means that the writing doesn't have to be good. Because pretty soon you just end up being incredibly defensive about your work instead of trying to just uphold the work that you've done. And I'm aware that that was a really all over the way, all over the place rant that I just had, but <sighs> I just get irked sometimes. In terms of my own writing, I did put a poll out <laughs> on Instagram uh, using that for my own writing because I keep getting stuck between should I write the Charity Shop novel or should I write the second Alice Valentine book? It's something that I've discussed on here before I even put a poll out in the community tab here and it's because both of these books have to be the next books that come out. Uh, they are set between Doris Ahoy, uh, they're not set between Doris Ahoy, they're set during the same time as Doris Ahoy. It's almost like Doris Ahoy, the charity shop book and the second Alice Valentine book, a, a trilogy of what's happening <laughs> in the interim period between Indisputably Doris and Royally Doris. And some of the events in the Charity Shop book have already been referenced in Royally Doris. Similarly, I don't know whether they've been referenced in Royally Doris from the second um, Alice Valentine cosy crime novel, but both books are planned. Both books have got some writing done. Like I'm at the 10,000 word mark with both of them, which in terms of Alice, I usually see them being 60,000 words. Like I, I always want to follow the Inspector Montalbano structure of having short, cosy crime novels. I don't see the need for them to be huge books, but then I say that with Royally Doris, but we, that was more of a rounding up of the entire series, which was why that book ended up being so dense. Alice Valentine could go either way. It could be a short book, it could be a long book. The entire thing's planned. It's just getting it written. And another issue I have with that is... I just seem to struggle with description again, which, again, referenced in the Literally Doris read-along video. I have always had this struggle with description, but I, I can see myself itching to get to a certain point writing that novel. And so whenever I'm writing, I feel like I'm writing too quickly to try and get to that point. And part of me just wants to try and slow down. Also, I end up worrying whether I'm not just repeating stuff that I've already done in An Air to Murder or I'm not capturing the characters as well as I did because it's been so long since I wrote them. And then in terms of the charity shop novel, there's this allure, I can't say that, allure? I want to read, I want to write that book because I know that it's a standalone and so I'm not going to have to go back to this book. I'm not going to have to write any sequels 
although people have already given me ideal ideas for sequels when I brought up other things that I want to include in it, <laughs> such as little short stories from the perspective of customers visiting the charity shop. Uh, but that, that could be a tale for another day. You know, it's like, it's just whenever I write something and I like it, I'm like, oh, I want to share this, but, you know, put a pin in it. Wait a few years, see if it works for anything else. Even when the general consensus was that people wanted me to write the charity shop novel next, there was still part of me that was like, well... <sighs> I get what you're saying, but I also feel like there are so many people who have waited for five years nearly. No, I finished it five years ago. There are so many people who have waited for three years now for the second Alice Valentine book. And that isn't a length of time that I wanted anybody to have to wait between books. I always say about publishing a book every other year. And so really, I shouldn't be worrying about bringing out another Alice book until twenty. 24 is that what next year is um but it's just this should be my year of just writing and get stuff in getting stuff up down on paper but there's just this worry that i'm taking too much of your time and that there's going to be a lack of interest when it eventually does come to this book and considering i'm asking readers to sign on to reading at least five books then it does feel somewhat harsh for me to say, actually, I'm going to go and write this other book, which I get great joy out of writing because I am writing about stuff for, that, for the most part, is entirely unrelated to the Doris books and to the cosy crime books. Yes, it's set in the same world, and we've met some of these characters before, but I'm also being a bit experimental in the writing, and I enjoy that, and I enjoy revisiting forms that I haven't re I haven't written in a while and I think that one I should get out of my head and just knuckle down and write and like if I did that whole writerly thing of writing a thousand words a day then one book could be finished in six months the other book could be finished in six months and we could move on um and they'd both be written within a year. And that is the way that I used to write when I was 11. <laughs> I have, like, the longest I ever took to write a book originally was 18 months. And that was when I was 16 or 17 years old uh, and in my A-level classes. And it took me 18 months. So it's I started slowing down in about 2007, and it took me a year to write a book, and then it took me longer. And indeed, with the final Doris book, that took me 20 months. Which, again, nearly two years. <laughs> nearly two years working on Royally Doris, just in terms of the writing. And so in terms of that entire book, it was three years' work. And I don't want to take that long writing these next two books. But at the moment, I can't see how I could get these books written any faster unless I do what I just said. So that's where I'm at currently. I I appreciate everybody who voted. And the thing with Instagram as well is you can see who voted what. And so part of me also looks at the people that have voted for Alice Valentine and the people that have voted for the charity shop book. And I'm like, well, here, is there a person whose opinion I value more? Is there somebody I would like to reward with this book um i don't know it's a tough one for me it's just who i am as a person i have been indecisive since birth either way that is for me to figure out not for you to worry about but do leave any opinions in the comments otherwise not really watched much still mildly addicted to the spotify daily mix so i, ha I haven't really listened to anything new but always welcome to recommendations <sighs> and I think that's it. So what are you reading? What are you watching? What are you writing? What are you listening to? Um, if you do want to discuss anything I've mentioned here today, then please feel free to do so. I hope that you have got something out of this video besides sheer boredom, because until next time, that is all.